So I really don't. I haven't seen them or come here. So Apple, Amazon, Google, and others um, are trying to change how people interact with computers. They're reducing friction by making it uh, a way for people to use voice first um, and resort to screens only when needed. Uh, this is creating a number of challenges and opportunities when it comes to branding. This month, Voice, uh, VoiceBot AI and Magic Plus Company uh, published uh, research, uh, and they quoted here, there's a number, there were a quarter of a trillion voice searches in 2018, and nearly 24% of U.S. customers are using voice search for products and brand-related queries. In the next 30 minutes, I want to touch on the components of a traditional brand as composed, uh, compared to a verbal brand. Then look into what it means to write for voice and why it's important. And then I'll touch on the future of voice technology and we'll wrap up with a Q&A session and we get through this in 30 minutes, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. You're pr probably familiar with all of these company logos, uh, from the Golden Arches to the Nike Swoosh. And the screen shows the logo of 11 companies these logos are a key part of visual branding. But using voice technology, uh, they're hard to hear. So in addition to logos or icons, many visual brands are also use slogans. Having a good slogan or tagline uh, can help you define your brand. So on this slide, I'm going to show the slogan of the four different companies. Slogans work both visually and verbally, both of those mediums. For this first one, for the love of it, it's Pepsi, Pepsi's slogan. And when I say taste the feeling, uh, we all think of Coca-Cola. Um, when I say I'm loving it, that's the tagline for the Golden Arches. Um, and when I say just do it, uh, we all associate that with Nike. When we see the traditional branding uh, components, we not only understand the products behind the branding, but we also have a feeling and expectation about the product. Building a brand is important, and as we'll see, your brand name will become critical in the voice first world. Each of these branding elements, name, logo or icon, slogan or tagline, color palette, font, and image style, they all work together to create a visual brand, but not a verbal brand. Customers have been moving to smaller screens, and the recent smart speaker trend is causing another shift in the effectiveness of traditional branding elements. It's easy to recognize the importance of visual branding. We protect our names, logos, and slogans. Uh, we define the use of consistent set of colors and fonts, all these help to create a visual brand. But now let's look at the components of a verbal brand. While a name is a name, uh, the auditory version of a name is uh, technically different than the visual version. Uh, to demonstrate these differences, I'll provide some examples on the next slide. The analog to a brand's logo or icon is a, brand, is a sonic brand sometimes referred to as an earcon. See what they did there, icon, earcon? Yeah, boo. Uh, sonic brands have been around for a long time, though. Um, and in a couple minutes, we'll play a game uh, where we'll associate a brand's icon to their earcon. A good slogan or tagline can help you define your brand. Uh, creating a tagline helps you get to the heart of your brand. Slogans or taglines help both visually and verbally in a brand. Color palettes, fonts, and images, though, they don't have verbal elements. Uh, and without them, the content of your site becomes front and center. So if we look at this and we take away your logo and your icon, we take away uh, your, uh, your color palettes, we take away your fonts, we take away your images, we take all that away, what's left? only thing that's left 
is your content. And so in a verbal world, the content is going to become front and center. It's going to become the, the critical component here. And we'll look at that in a few minutes. So let's look at names. <clears throat> to demonstrate the difference between sight and sound, uh, let's talk about homonyms and heteronyms. So let's start, start with heteronyms. <clears throat> So when you visit, visit this website, what should you expect to see? A, a, a lead bass player of an orchestra? Or maybe a lead-colored bass? Um, heteronyms are words that are spelled the same but have different meanings to them. Homonyms, on the other hand, are spelled differently but they sound the same. These are all spelled differently, but when you say them, they sound the same. So if we look at the two cents.com and the two cents.com and the two cents.com and the two cents.com, who owns the verbal version of this? Right? I was a, I was actually surprised by the number of homonyms in the English English language. There's there's hundreds of them. Look them up on the internet. There's a lot of homonyms in the English language. So in a visual world, we know about domain names. In the verbal world, these domain names are called invocation names. So let me describe an invocation name a little better. We all build websites. Uh, these are hosted on a computer with an IP address. Uh, the domain name is how a browser references your website. Just like building a website, in the voice world, we build voice apps. Google calls these voice apps actions. Uh, Amazon calls these voice apps skills. Uh, Bixby calls them containers or something like that. Um, capsules is what Bixby calls them. Um, so, they're, But they're all the same thing. It's a voice app. It's similar to a website, but in uh, for the voice world. Amazon allows multiple voice apps to have the same invocation name. Google followed the domain name model. So Google, in the Google world, um, there's only one invocation name. And whoever gets that first owns it. So in that two cents example, whoever registers the, uh, the invocation name of two cents, they're the ones that own that, uh, own that name going forward. In the visual world, getting on page one is good enough. Uh, but in the verbal world, when you ask for something, you're not expecting ten different responses. You're expecting the answer. And so in the verbal world, there's uh, being on the first page isn't good enough. You need to be the answer. So what's this mean? It means that Google or Amazon or Apple is going to decide what the answer is to any existing query or any time somebody's talking to in a voice world, those companies get to decide what is the answer as opposed to what is the set of answers. So this is why owning and marketing your brand is critical. Uh, voice, and, uh, voice SEO is still in its infancy. Um, the key areas here that, that help Help at this moment are our, um, our Wikipedia seems to be a source, Yelp seems to be a source, um, Google Business, the information that you put in there seems to be a source, um, Amazon Choice, which we'll look at in a minute, um, there seems to be a source. There's no definitive guide though of do these things and you'll have arrived as far as the, the voice SEO. It's still in its infancy, so it's still evolving. But here's some uh, information that uh, Google has provided as far as voice, uh, voice SEO. Uh, in a blog post and article published by Google, they provided guidelines which eva include evaluation across four dimensions. Uh, information satisfaction, in other words, provide a direct answer to the questions. Uh, the length, you've got to be concise uh, in your answer uh, to the question. Formulation, the answer has got to be easy to understand, and then elocution, uh, the answer has
has to be easy to turn into audio. We're going to look at a, a few of those examples in a minute as far as that. But these are the, the guidelines that Google has put out there for if you want to be able to get your content um, selected by their systems. This is what they're, they're expecting. But let's look at a couple of branding elements, uh, examples from Amazon. So I'm doing this upholstery project, uh, which has a million staples to remove. I started with a tack remover, and after getting through the first layer of one piece, I found out there was multiple layers, and so I, I went to Amazon to order a, an upholstery staple remover. Um, so these two seem to be uh, uh, good, good, good possibilities. Um, both of them looked uh, uh, almost identical. In a voice first world, if I ask for an upholstery staple remover, which one of these am I going to get? If you do much shopping on Amazon, uh, you'll notice that they've been putting this Amazon's choice on their products. The key is not the Amazon choice, the key is the text next to it. So if I ask for an upholstery staple remover, which one am I going to get? Let's look at another example. So here are a couple more items. Uh, when you uh, look at the description for each of these, these are uh, industrial hard helmets, chainsaw helmets, basically, uh, for using that. Um, look at the, the Amazon's choice designation here. Here's where branding becomes critical. Guess what happens if I ask for a chainsaw helmet instead of a still helmet? That's right. I'm getting the TR Industrial Hard Hat. Um, branding trains our audience to ask for the still branded helmet instead of just the chainsaw helmet. So this is where getting our brand out there is, is critical. And making sure our audience knows that they need to ask for our branded components as opposed to generic components. Okay, let's look at sonic branding. Here I'm going to uh, um, put a, an image up there, a logo, and before I put the logo up, I'm going to give you a sound. So let's see how well we, we can associate a person, a, a, these companies, Sonic brand with their actual, uh, their, their logo. So Sonic branding has been around for a long time, um, so let's, uh, let's listen to this one. <laughs> GM, those of us that have been around for a while, we, we've seen that for forever. They had a Sonic brand a long time ago. How about this one? NBC. NBC. Clearly people were watching TV. Okay. How about this one here? Samsung. some more work to do on your Sonic branding, okay, but so we'll, we'll keep going, we'll, we'll get some of these. T-Mobile, yep, good. How about this one? MasterCard. Now, you should not have gotten MasterCards, just so you know, because MasterCard came out with a new Sonic brand, this one, in February of this year, so that you probably haven't heard it enough to start associating it. Uh, but you will. Um, uh, companies, matter of fact, I just saw an article yesterday where AXA has come out with a brand new Sonic brand, which is there's just kind of interesting. It's the same note ten times. Uh, so this idea of Sonic branding is associating their uh, their Sonic brand with their uh, their company. So let's keep going. Sonic brand, and I'm going to play it for you, uh, I don't know, maybe eight times. Um, and you're going to hear where they've taken their Sonic brand, and 
and they've embedded it into their advertising in a lot of different ways. Listen to this one. Same set of notes. Those set of notes are Coca-Cola's brand, their Sonic brand, and they use that in all their advertising. So you'll see different advertising in different areas, but they embed their Sonic brand into uh, into their advertising. While Sonic branding has been around for a long time, it's becoming more popular in part because of voice technology. Sonic branding works both visually and verbally. It's not just big brands that have earphones. If you watch, I mean, listen, uh, you'll notice them in many, many places. They're auditory cues that help you instinctively know what's coming next. Sometimes when we think about our brands, we focus on the flashy elements, um, and we miss some of the less visible ones. But when we're only listening and not looking, the visual branding elements don't exist. It's at this time when the less visible, less obvious components become critical um, when we're just hearing the content. Content is king. In this section, I'll provide a few tips on how to prepare for voice and hopefully pique the interest of some early adopters uh, of voice technology. Since your content is critical to your brand, let's look at two areas which impact how your brand is seen, I mean, heard. First, let's look at how your content is organized, and then let's look at the actual form of your content. Let's start with how your content is organized. Uh, is your content grouped in such a way that your content be can be found and delivered as expected? Grouping involves categorizing and organizing your content into pages, headings and tags and labels uh, to be able to get your content grouped correctly. Uh, this is important from two perspectives. To make it easier for Google and Amazon or a screen reader, that fact, to be able to find the one answer uh, from your content. And two, to give clues on how to deliver your content. In other words, how best to turn your content into audio. Let's look at an example of that. On the screen, I've got an excerpt from, my, uh, from one of our blog posts, um, and it's up there twice. The two versions look very similar, right? But the HTML coding is different behind them, which I'll show you in just a minute. Let's listen to the first part of each of these and see how they sound differently. And the elderly comments from participants, this first commenter shares how Alexa opened her world. Alexa and the elderly. Comments from participants. This first commenter shares how Alexa opened her world. I thought Alexa was just for things like turning on lights, but it opened a whole new world. You can do anything that you want to do. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, the HTML. What's it look like? Notice that the first one specifies font size, but there isn't really a verbal version of font size, right? So what's a, what's a reader do? It just keeps right on going. It throws out these font, the font sizes. So those tags are ignored. In the second one, we're going to specify that these are headings. Now headings provide meaning. So in other words, in the verbal, in the visual world, headings are going to say this is how things should be formatted. But in the verbal world, it gives clues to say, wait a minute, this is a different type of information. And so it needs to be read differently. So headings provide meaning which can be used to find the section of your content as well as to change the delivery of the audio. So using Gutenberg, it's important that you specify heading blocks um, as opposed to text blocks reformatted to look like heading blocks. For the 
those of us who code our stuff by hand, it's the age tags. <coughs> okay, next organizational element that impacts our brand name is figures. Figures include pictures, charts, tables, and graphs. These don't translate well into audio. Figures are inherently visual in nature. We put figures into our content for one of three reasons, though, and this is important. We put them in as simple decorations. Now, decorations add life and interest to your website, um, similar to colors and fonts. Adding consistently themed decorations to your website can enhance your brand. But decorations can be removed from the content without impacting the content. So you can pull out pictures that aren't, that are just decorations, and it's not going to change your content. We also, oops, I'm going to keep going. As examples, that's the other type of figure that you put out there. Um, examples help your audience understand your content. And so, uh, these types of figures explain the text in another way. So I've got my content up there, and I'm going to put a figure up there, and I'm going to use that as an example to my text. And so it's adding some additional value to, the, uh, to my text that I put up there. Lastly, uh, we put figures on our sites uh, as information. So supplemental information provides information which not, is not found in our text. Uh, these types of figures contain information which we expect our uh, our, our viewers to see and deduce. So if the figure is not seen, then some of the content from your site is missing or not fully understood. For each of these figures, it's important to help evaluate why they exist. This will help ensure that you handle them appropriately for your verbal brand. In a, mo a minute, I'll show you the mechanics but first, let's discuss how to handle each of them. So figures such as decorations, you just need to describe the image. So I put the image there, and I just am describing what that, what, what is that image, so that if somebody's not seeing the image, it's like there's an image there, and here's what it, the image is of. If the figure is an example, then we need to not just describe what the image is, but we need to describe why I put it there. It's an example, and here's what information that I'm expecting my user to see from the example, I need to put that into the, into, the, uh, into my content. If it's supplemental information, this one here is a little bit more tricky, I put that graph or I put that, that table, I put it there and I'm expecting the, you, the visual person to be able to look at that and pull out the pieces of information out of that table or out of that chart and understand something. Now that's great for your sighted people. But people who are not sighted, or when we start going to smart speakers and, and the like, when people are not actually looking at your content, you now need to describe that information in your content. So you can say, this is why this table is here. These are the things that you need to understand from the table, that if you can't see the table, this is why, this is what you need to be able to pull out of that table or out of that graph or from that other figure. So the two areas that we actually put that information is either in the alt text or the fig caption. We'll do a little example here. Here's an example from one of my blog posts. This is an example of a graphic decoration. So this one here is just a picture. Um, the image is added to my blog post. It adds some light there so that it's not just text, so somebody can have a pretty picture to see as, they, as they're going, going by. Um, but I didn't put any uh, alt text or I didn't put any uh, caption on it. So we'll all Computers are getting pretty good at taking a, a, an image and figuring out what's on there, but it's not perfect yet. So at this moment, we're still putting that information in as, the, as a caption, big caption, and or uh, the alt text. So if you're using Gutenberg, it's relatively easy. You put that figure uh, onto your site, and it's actually going to ask you a couple of things. Alt text, put it in here, um, and or put the fig caption right under the image. It gives you both places to put it in there. If you're coding it by hand, you're going to have to figure out how to put in the, the alt text and the, uh, and the fig caption uh, elements into it. So at a minimum, we want to insert alt text to convey the information about the image. For decoration, we just need to describe the image. This is a school image of an apple. Uh, smart speaker. 
an example, we're going to want to not just describe the image, we're going to say this is why this image is here and how it supports the text that, you, that you're hearing. If it's supplemental information, the information that they need out of it is not in the text. And so you'll want to put the information that you expect somebody to understand from that figure, you're going to need to put that into the old text and or the big caption so that they can, will get that information that they're not going to get from the text. As you can see, that adding the caption appears as part of the figure on my web post, um, but when translating into audio, the image is going to be ignored or throwing the image away because that doesn't turn into audio. Um, but the caption is going to be read something like, you know, there's an image with a caption which reads books, Apple, and smart speaker. While the alt text is not visible, it can be used to provide additional context about why you inserted the image. Okay, so now let's look at the details of our content. Diction is our choice of words. An example would be, um, do I use the word begin, or start, or initiate, or commence? I'm using different words on purpose. Grammar and syntax is how we structure our words, um, ranging from simple sentences, think Dr. Seuss, uh, to dense, complex syntax, uh, think doctoral thesis, and stuff like that. As a hint, when we speak, we often use simpler sentences <clears throat> than when we write. And so when we're turning stuff into audio, you're going to be, we need to be cognizant of that, that we need to write simpler or as we move stuff to audio. <clears throat> So when, I, uh, when I'm writing for audio, I found that I need to simplify my writing uh, to make it easier to understand when Alexa or Google uh, is turning my content into audio. Style is how we choose to communicate a thought or idea. Uh, think news versus teaching versus storytelling or, or even dialogue. So let's dive into these a little bit further. Give some examples here. Okay. In a minute, I'm going to put on the screen something that you've all seen in the Facebook post. It's a bunch of misspelled words. And we're, amazed, uh, we're reminded how amazing our brains are, that when we see stuff, we can automatically translate what I should be saying. I don't know about you, but I have a problem with some of my blog posts because I read them over and over and over again. It's like, it's right. But when I listen to it, it's like, I didn't write that. I go back and look. Oh, sure enough, I wrote that. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's listen to this from the perspective of our eyes sometimes see things and translate it for us and fix it for us, but our ears don't do that as well. So let's listen to this here. It deals in care and what already the tears in a rod are. The only intermediate time is taught the first and L second journey at the ring peakly. Okay, you guys got that? Yeah, no. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at it. So if we're reading this, okay, doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letters be at the right place. So we, we can read it and our eyes to our brain fix it, but when we're hearing it, it's like I got no clue. So spelling matters when you start moving stuff to voice. Let's put it that way. So you can have a misspelled word in your blog post that people may not even see it. Some people, but a lot of people are just going to miss it. But when it goes to audio, it's going to become obvious that, uh, that, that the spelling is not there. Okay, let's do some more. While errors should be fixed contrary to what my English teacher taught me, it's not true that our brand requires using the King's English. Uh, your brand should dictate the diction. Let me say that again. Your brand should dictate your diction, grammar, and style used in your website. We expect the language used by an MIT article to be different from the language used by the California server blog, right? And that should be different from the language used by the Southern Miss Manners blog. Your brand should capture the attention of your audience. Let's look at a few examples. This is from the Mercedes-Benz. No car in its segment can claim the performance pedigree of an AMG C-Class. Countless German touring car championships fill its trophy case, 
And with thundering power and lightning quick response, it's a fitting trophy to your own garage. Language diction makes sense here. So let's look at this one. Let's compare the diction, grammar, and style of the Mercedes-Benz website to this West Virginia blog. I wish I could count the times I heard Mama's voice holler at my name whilst I was sitting there, surrounded by friends, cool air, and the ghost of the future I knew nothing about. Here's an example from the National Geographic site for kids. It uses an educational style with a grammar and diction suitable for kids. Check out the description of Massachusetts. What looks like a big hook in Massachusetts' eastern coastline is actually land created by glaciers that expose many rocky bays. Called the coastal lowlands, this hilly, wet area includes Cape Cod Bay, Martha's Vineyard, and the Nantucket Islands, all great for fishing, boating, and vacationing. Your brand should use a consistent diction, grammar, and style which resonates with your audience and helps them identify with your brand. Let's look at one more distinguishing mark of our content, voice. Voice is the mechanics of how we speak. Amber, volume, language, and accent. For those with podcasts, voice is the part of the recording process. It's how you distinguish between the speakers. So how does voice apply to a written content? Glad you asked. Let's visit my blog example one more time and to highlight voice. Okay, so let's listen to this one more time. This blog post. Alexa and the elderly. Comments from participants. This first commenter shares how Alexa opened her world. I thought Alexa was just four things like turning on lights, but it opened a whole new world. You can do anything that you want to do. And this last comment references how using Alexa helps someone with physical difficulties. I have a genetic tremor, so entering data is a pain. The ability to speak a command and get something to happen is a wonderful thing. Notice the words were the same, but when delivered by a different voice, it brought some life to the content. You're probably all familiar with HTML. In the text-to-speech world, a new set of tags are available called SSML, Speech Synthetic Markup Language. These additional markups can be used to help turn written content into audio content. What you heard was read by an Amazon Alexa smart speaker. Notice the additional SSML tags inserted into my blog post. Here's where I specified the, the, the reader that I wanted to use uh, as this blog post was turned into audio. Okay, so let's look at several quotes regarding the future of voice technology. This first quote is from Joe Murphy, CEO of Vocalize AI. At Vocalize AI, we predict that a company-branded voice user interface will soon be a must-have feature for almost all mobile phone apps. In an article titled, The Future of Voice and the Implications for News, published for the Reuters Institute, Nick Newman says, voice remains a critical focus for technology platforms. Platforms believe that it will change the way we interact with the internet, and that in turn will disrupt and change their business models, be that e-commerce, advertising, or hardware sales. The tech company's vision for voice goes way beyond smart speakers to become embedded in every device, supporting and anticipating users' needs. Thinking domestically, going to be asking our stoves to preheat to 350 degrees while we walk over to the sink and ask the faucet to give us three cups of water. I'm personally waiting for my washing machine to, to let me know what it's done because the, the time says 10 minutes. It's never 10 minutes. So I'm waiting for it to figure out it's done and say, hey, Chip, your, uh, your, your wash is done. It's coming. This whole voice thing interacting where every device is going to have the ability to understand.
understand and respond to uh, to us and respond to give us information back. It's, it's in, in the process. Rick Armour from Clearbridge Mobile, which is a software development firm specializing in mobile apps, wrote that voice is the future of how brands will interact with their customers. And this next quote, voice commerce will completely change the way people shop because it adds a level of ease and personalization to their everyday tasks. And for those who follow Gary V, you know that he sees voice technology disrupting many industries. In his interview with Andy Seward, the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Finance, he says, everybody is going to do a lot more things with Alexa and Google Home and Apple iPod. They will think than they think like they're going to today, like order every single food that they eat. And then this one here, I'll end with a couple of quotes from the NPR and Edison Smart Audio Report released last month. Numbers of smart speakers in U.S. household grew by 78% in one year. And then 68% of smart speaker owners use the device daily. This research no longer is talking about if. Uh, the researchers are now talking about when uh, voice technology is going to be ubiquitous. I think it's clear voice technology is becoming a new platform for engaging your audience. Okay, I think we've got like four minutes for questions. Um, you can get these slides on my website at uh, createmyvoice.com slash wc boss. And I'll put my contact information up here and we've got just a few more minutes for any questions before I'm um, Yes? So as far as Sonic Brand, as, um, the, the EarCon, that piece of it, yes, yeah, so companies are, are, are coming up with, here's my Sonic Brand, um, and it's usually a really short snippet is usually what it is. And if you start listening to podcasts, you'll start hearing them often put at the beginning, um, or sometimes beginning and end. I think I, the one with uh, Axa that I said uh, just read some stuff, that they're going to be putting theirs near the end of their, their content. Uh, but you're seeing it put on their websites, in their podcasts, um, advertising, commercials, all that kind of stuff. They Just like, here's my icon, any place that I have, I'm going to put my icon. Any place that there's some sound available, you're going to be putting your earcon up there. And yeah, people are doing a lot more of it. Yeah? What about trademarking regarding that? Yes. So, so yes, you, you absolutely can trademark your uh, your um, your earcon, um, your your Sonic brand. Yes. Now, there's there's some rules about what you can and can't um, trademark from a a, a, a a Sonic perspective. So you have to make sure that. But yes, people do it just like their icons, just like their logos, stuff like that. You you can trademark your, uh, your audio version. Yes. Okay. Um, so you were saying earlier that different websites require different standards for who gets to own that invocation. So with those different standards, how do you ensure brand unity and brand consistency across multiple platforms? Okay. So my comment about so the question was invocation names. Yes. Um, and the question is on invocation names. How is that done? Um, and each of the uh, companies that do voice technology, so Bixby, um, Apple, Google, Amazon, and there's others, they have, a, they have their mechanism for saying, here's how a voice app can get created, and here's how you invoke that voice app. The way that you start that voice app is called an invocation name. And there are standards that each of these companies have as far as what it takes to be able to put a voice app out there, to be able to own that name. 
And so when you submit your voice app, when you publish your website, when you submit your voice app, uh, you, you say, here's the invocation name that I want tied to this voice app. What's the follow-up question on that? Because I don't so, think I answered your question exactly. Yes, so the follow-up is, let's say that you want to have your voice app on multiple things. Like, yes. How would you make sure that the uh, end user would be able to invoke that app on one platform and be able to do the same thing on another one? Is there a way to ensure that? Yes. So the answer to that is, at this moment, each, each uh, company has their own way. You have to submit answer this one. You have to create a voice app for Google and a voice app for Amazon, a voice app for this. The, the, you, you have to create a separate one in each environment right now. And in each of those you have to say, here's the invocation name that gets tied to my voice app in each of these environments. And it's not standard and it's, there's nothing to cross. You have to do a, a separate one for each, each environment. So I think we're out of time now, so I will uh, hang out in the uh, uh, outside, outside the room here. If there's any other questions, I'd be glad to answer them. So thank you very much.